Hey, everybody. Welcome here tonight. What a great crowd. I, I, I think our guest speaker has a few friends and uh, fans here tonight. I think that's absolutely wonderful. Thanks for showing up. My name is Jim Bacon. I'm executive director of the Jefferson Council. And I would like to thank our partners in putting on this event, the College Republicans, the Center for Politics, and the Heterodox Academy. The Jefferson Council and its partners have brought many prominent speakers to the University of Virginia over the past few years. Their voices added perspectives that students likely never would have heard otherwise. Some were famous, some were provocative, but uh, uh, all of them had a lot to say, but none of them had views that were more closely aligned with the goals of the Jefferson Council than Jonathan Haidt. The Council's vision, put quite simply, is to see UVA become the most exciting place in America to learn, teach, and pursue knowledge. Achieving such a lofty ambition requires three things above all, free speech, civil discourse, and intellectual diversity. Mr. Hyatt champions all three. Without free speech, a university falls into repressive orthodoxy. But free speech is not sufficient by itself to create the intellectual vitality that we seek. We also need civil discourse, not people shouting at each other. But even free speech and civil discourse are not sufficient to advance knowledge. We need intellectual diversity as well. We need people not only willing to challenge one another's thinking, but people equipped with the ideas to mount those challenges. If those ideas are not taught, the resulting discourse will be feeble indeed. At the Jefferson Council, we find the clash of ideas to be exhilarating. We don't want to live in a world where everyone agrees with us. We want to be continually challenged, for that is the only way we grow. Our speaker tonight likely disagrees with us about many things. Members of the Jefferson Council skew towards conservative viewpoints. And Mr. Haidt, if I recall correctly from his book, The Coddling of the American Mind, confessed to having never voted for a Republican candidate for president ever. But we do agree about what it takes to build a great university. Tonight, Mr. Haidt will share his diagnosis of where American universities went wrong and how to revive them as centers of free inquiry. Aside from being a brilliant scholar who has transformed the way Americans think about topics from morals and politics to child rearing and mental illness, he is perhaps the most incisive critic of higher education in the United States. In 2015, when the rest of society had only an inkling of what was happening in the ivory tower, he co-founded the Heterodox Academy dedicated to correcting the decline of intellectual diversity in higher ed and promoting the principles of open inquiry and constructive disagreement. It is a hopeful sign for UVA that the local chapter of Heterodox is one of the most vibrant in the country with more than 40, no, I'm sorry, 60 members reflecting a wide range of partisan and philosophical viewpoints. We are most eager to hear what our speaker has to say. I present to you, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, thanks so much, Jim. Um, I'm having some major vocal cord problems over the last few months, and so I have to speak very quietly into a microphone, but it seems to be working, so we'll go with that. Um, so, so thank you, Jim. Thank you to the Jefferson Council for, for bringing me in, for making this possible, and for being one of the things that makes UVA so far ahead of almost everybody else on the road to that laudable goal of being an exciting place to be a student. Most of us who are older, we remember our college days, and we remember excitement and fun. Since the 90s and early 2000s, for a lot of reasons, administrators have been trying to suck all the fun they can out of college, because what if someone gets hurt? And they've been trying to push out a lot of the viewpoint diversity for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about tonight. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, it's often customary to start a talk with, you know, what a pleasure it is to be here, and but this is, an incredible pleasure for me. Um, I, um, whenever I, whenever I have been away for a while, I come back and I always do the lawn entrance. I always enter the lawn or by the Colonnade Club, and the reason is because when I, in 1989, when I was a graduate student at Penn, 
I, I went on a road trip with a friend of mine who was also a grad student, and uh, we were going through the South. We thought, oh, let's stop in at UVA. We've never been there. And, you know, okay, well how do you find the lawn? Like, it, it's like, how do you get into it? And so we're just kind of wandering around, and we found, oh, there's a little door. We went through that little, you know, those little doorways, and then this, this thing opens out, and it's so beautiful. And, you know, students were playing Frisbee and having fun and sitting and reading books, and it's just like, wow, like this, this is a college. Like, oh, I, I hope I can, like, teach here someday. And then I did, you know, I was... So that was just magical to um, to be a professor here at UVA, and um, uh, and you know I I love being a professor. I love the fact that I'm part of a of a twenty five hundred or twenty three hundred however you want to count it year old profession. It traces itself back to the the, the origins of organized uh, pursuit of knowledge, um, and um, and I love. Um, I love the, the academic world, uh, but something is going wrong with it, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, oh, first I just want to show you, this is when I lived in Charlottesville. This was, I had a, a lab group. I, 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 um, this is where I did almost all of my research. That's, um, um, oh, and, oh wait, there's Emily, wait, Emily Wilson, wait, there she is. So here in the audience, so Emily was a 16-year-old high school kid or who came and, and I didn't realize she was so young, but I took her on as a, as a research assistant and it's, and it's great. And yeah, Ken Elzinga is here, I think, somewhere. Ken, yeah, there's Ken, um, who was the superstar teacher when I was here. I was teaching the Psych 101 class and my students cared a lot more about studying for your exam than they did about <laughs> mine. So... Um, <coughs> so anyway, it's wonderful to be back, and I just, you know, I put this up, and it's especially poignant for me because that's my son Max when he was uh, two or three years old, and um, uh, and now he's applying to colleges, and he applied to UVA, it's his top choice, and he applied early decision, and he was waitlisted. <laughs> so those of you who can pray, please <laughs> pray <laughs> for my son Max. Um, um, okay, so... So let's turn to the to the subject at hand. So what I want to talk about today is is what happened to the universities. But I'm going to start by talking about a, a different institution, the military. The military, uh, for a while, was the most trusted institution in the country. And here you see a graph of public confidence in the military, and they had a, a very large decline. And um, it turns out the re part of the reason for it. <coughs> is that there was this weird thing going on, especially in the Air Force. Evangelical Christians were kind of taking over and turning it into almost like their own project. And if the U.S. military is a Christian operation organized for Christians, what a terrible thing that would be to have a major institution taken over by people with their own agenda. And of course, of course, public confidence would drop, but it dropped in an interesting way. So if you look, um, so if you go back to 2012, 2015, of course, Christians have a very positive view of the military. Um, but non-Christians did too, some, uh, you know, a little less, but still positive. But what happened after all the publicity around this is that it flipped and non-Christians lost their trust in the military. Now, none of this is true. I made this up, this <laughs> slide. Th this, this stuff actually was all true, but it didn't have that much of an effect. The reason why I made up this slide, you'll see in a moment. <coughs> now let's look at a different institution, American universities, American higher ed. We had probably the greatest brand in the world, far better than you know IBM back in those days or Apple today. American higher ed was one of the, probably the most respected institution on the planet. Um, and all of the top universities are American. Uh, if you get a British listing, they'll put Oxford and Cambridge in there. But America, since the Second World War, has completely dominated. Everyone tries to copy us. We've done something. We've got some magic potion here um, in American universities. And I think the key to our brand, so I teach in a business school now, so everything has to be about creating value or brands. Um, so our brand w was absolutely based on two factors, intellectual excellence. The smartest people are here in these institutions with the resources to do things that change the world. And absolute honesty. A scholar can never, ever lie. Everything we say must be true, and with a footnote to document that we have some 
source of authority. And that's why you'll hear, you'll still hear phrases in the news like, a study from Harvard said, or Harvard University said, as if the university could speak. But what they're saying is, this came out of a university, so we can trust it. That's the way Americans used to talk. And then this happened. Um, this is that famous scene in the courtyard at Yale, uh, where students were screaming at Professor Nicholas Christakis because his wife sent a caring, thoughtful email out about a DEI policy. And the students freaked out. They demanded she be fired. They demanded that he apologize. So this was just one opening event. It's not that this caused it, but this was the biggest of the early events in 2015. And um, they gave demands to Peter Salovey. Peter Salovey met as many demands as he legally could. He promised $50 million for diversity hiring. Um, and the incredible success of those protests led to a nationwide protest. This happened all over the country. Um, now, there was not violence in the first couple of years, in 2015, 2016, very little violence. But in 2017, after Donald Trump was elected and then passions on the left were inflamed, that's the semester when we had actual violence um, and people getting really hurt um, <coughs> in physical attacks, like a professor at Middlebury was uh, in permanent neck injury. Um, and it's still going on today, or rather I should say it was still going on uh, into early 2023, um, these sorts of uh, shouting down of protests and typically Nothing happens to those who shout down a speaker. Nothing, almost never, has a student in America been punished for shouting down a speaker. And that is why we see this graph. This is the real graph from Pew. So as you can see, Democrats have always had a very positive view of higher education, um, where, and Republicans actually were generally, po I mean, it was above, you know, neutral. They were moderately positive. Um, about higher ed. And then what happens is this. Everybody on the right or in the center saw these videos over and over again of students screaming at professors, cursing them, um, um, and nothing happened to them. And they're like, what is going on in the universities? And especially if the universities basically became part of the, part of the blue team, we're the research arm of the blue team. So why should anyone who's not on the blue team, trust us. <coughs> but it gets worse. This is uh, Gallup data from, um, from June. What you can see is that now even Democrats are losing some trust, and of course Republicans, but Gallup allowed us to break, a, break this down, including moderates. And if you look at moderates and independents, the fact that they have lost an enormous amount of trust is an extraordinarily serious development for higher ed. This should be a five alarm fire for everybody in higher ed leadership. And that was in June. That was before October 7th. It was before October 8th and 9th, which were the days when nobody said anything. No university leaders, I mean a few, but most didn't say anything on October 8th or 9th. But there were plenty of students on campus who were, and professors who were celebrating the terrorist attack. And this caused huge revulsion around the country. Um, and then it got worse. Uh, this is my own office building at Stern, at NYU Stern. Students put up kidnap protesters, other NYU students, they were caught doing this, other NYU students were going around ripping them all down. <coughs> and then this happened. December 5th, this I believe, I'm hoping, will be the equivalent of Waterloo. I don't remember when Waterloo happened, but whatever, you know, <laughs> Whatever it was that happened at Waterloo, I think happened in this congressional hearing room when these presidents could not answer simple questions, did not seem to have intellectual ef excellence, and boy, did they not have honesty. They were essentially lying about, oh, we, you know, free speech, we're you know, a bastion of free speech. No, you're not. Um, and then it got worse, as if it couldn't get any worse, but it did. The president of Harvard, turned out to have plagiarized everything, including her acknowledgments in her dissertation. And then it got worse because the Harvard Council Committee, whatever it's called, backed her and said, well, even though she's a plagiarist, she, you know, you know, she has our complete confidence. And then some professors started trying to explain, well, it's not really plagiarism what she did. I mean, so the, the, the hypocrisy, the dishonesty, the incompetence, I believe led to a complete, a complete brand crash. We start hearing people saying, basically, 
the universities are terrible things. We should get rid of them. They are destroying the country. Now, I don't believe that's true on net, but I do think that they're doing a lot of bad things along with a lot of good things. And as a person who loves universities, I'm ashamed and horrified that we've done this and we did it to ourselves. So how did we do it? How can, I, I don't think anyone in the business world could ever do this. How could you do this so quickly? Destroy one of the best brands on the planet. I just can't imagine Apple would ever do this to itself. Um, I've been studying this uh, since uh, um, 2011. I have an academic paper on why we need viewpoint diversity. Um, <coughs> I started Heterox Academy in 2015, wrote this Atlantic article uh, with Greg Lukianoff in 2015, um, and then it came out as a book in 2018. Hold on a sec. Okay, I have to remember what my voice coach said, which is I should change the pitch. Don't be on one pitch too long. It, all right, so <coughs> I'll try to be more dynamic. And, you know, um, okay. Um, and, so, and then my most recent book, or rather, this is coming out in six weeks, The Anxious Generation, pre-order it on Amazon now. Um, this goes into, it sort of picks up where the coddling left off, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of the research on what has happened to Gen Z, which is a big part of, the pr of what's happened on campus. Um, so my talk, the rest of my talk will have, uh, I'm going to go through these three points. Uh, there's uh, so much that could be said, but I thought what I would convey to you is sort of just three points that really will cover a lot of what has happened um, uh, in the meltdown of the university since 2015. So first, let's talk about, about Gen Z and about mindset. So um, when I, oh, I should, well, when I, when I teach uh, students, I often ask them the question of what is the most fundamental question in life? And they say things like, you know, why am I here? Is there a God? What is the meaning of life? And then I, I say, well, those are good questions, but that's not the right answer because fundamental means fundament, basis, foundation, the thing upon which everything else is built. And if you want to look at life, so this is a, you know, a, a bacterial cell with a, with a tail, I don't know if it's a paramecium or whatever, but as soon as single-celled organisms develop the ability to move, much of the rest of evolution is which way? And you've got to optimize that. And by the time you get to fish, you've got these lar relatively large brains that are all about sensory organs to help you decide which way to go, and then motor to, you know, stuff to make you go there. And then by the time you get to a human, the system is so gigantic that it curves around on itself. Uh, we have, um, a sp uh, uh, there's what's called the behavioral uh, in, uh, activation system. This is all the approach motivations. It's not literally lateralized like that perfectly, but it predominantly on the left frontal cortex are all the systems that make us um, lock onto a target, want to get there, feel excited, approach. And conversely, when something goes wrong or there's a threat or you're scared, front right systems activate and you stop, you pull back, uh, uh, you're very, very different and that can happen in a second. So I'm gonna give these different names, uh, names that are easier to process. I'm gonna call the one on the left discover mode. When your brain is in that state, these are, this is what you're like. And this is certainly why I, f I felt as a freshman in college. You get this gigantic, back then there were, there were paper books for the undergrads, just so you, you know, courses, there used to be a book and you'd have to flip through it. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it was like being a kid in a candy shop. Um, but if you're in defend mode, you, you behave very differently. And so if you think about a student showing up here at UVA or in any school in the country, if they're in discover mode and they can spend four years mostly in discover mode, you can't stop them from learning. They're going to learn. But if they show up in defend mode and everything's a threat, everything's a danger, who knows what this is, I should be careful, they're not going to learn much. Um, and that somehow is what happened to Americans born after 1995. So in 2012, when all the students were millennials, these were the rates of these disorders, and they rose a bit. But the yellow one is psychological disorders. That's the defining difference between the millennials and Gen Z. Gen Z has very high rates of psychological disorder. The millennials did not. <coughs> um, it's not all psychological disorders. It's especially uh, anxiety and depression. So in this graph, as in the graphs I'll show you, 
if you stop your data collection in 2010, you see no trend. There's nothing going on in the 2000s. And as soon as you go past 2012, this happens. Uh, the, the rates of anxiety and depression especially go way up so that this is now a normal part of being a college student is having anxiety disorder. It's not a majority, but it's almost a majority. It's, it's, we're getting near, it, we're in the 30s and 40s for each disorder, so you, you add them up or you, who ha, you know, people have one or the other. Um, uh, and you, know, you might say, well, you know, life is just scarier now. I mean, this is happening to everyone and deaths of despair for older people, right? Not really. Let's do it by age. It's Gen Z. Gen Z uh, went off the rails in the 2010s. Older generations did not. Um, this, you know, this would include some of the younger millennials. And very importantly here for the story, um, a lot of this uh, is gendered. Um, the mood disorders especially really hit the girls. Girls' mental health plunges in 2013, and it just keeps getting worse. Um, this, uh, th the data for 2022 just came out two weeks ago. So I updated the graph and I put it in. What do you think that is? That's COVID. COVID was trivial compared to the long-term trend since 2012. COVID made things a little worse, but the trend line basically is where it would have been if COVID hadn't happened. <coughs> Another important part of the story, which will be especially relevant for, for, uh, for this audience thinking about political diversity, is there most studies of teenagers don't ask about your politics, but a couple of them do. And when you can look at what's happening to kids on the left versus the right, here's what you see. So it's long been known that, um, that conservatives are a little happier than liberals. It, there's some debate about whether it's real, but that's, it's often found. Conservatives are a little bit happier, they're a little less, less neurotic, they're more conscientious, um, they're a little less creative. So you know, those of you who are conservative don't feel like I'm just saying you're, you're good and they're bad. Um, but these are generally fairly small differences, but they're, they're there. And that's a lot, if you've read The Righteous Mind, you know this is a lot of what makes some people attracted to the left or the right. And we need that diversity. People think differently. Um, <coughs> but what happens once we get past 2012? It's especially the liberal girls. They, they, their mental health collapses first and fastest. And more recently, I've done this sort of analysis by religious versus not religious. Same thing. In fact, it's even bigger than politics. Kids who are from religious families, they got a little worse in the 2010s. Kids from secular families, much worse. Um, so something is going on here about the rootedness in community, and I may come back to that. Um, but this is why, this is why, when this all broke out, you know, almost everyone on campus is on the left, or at least all the faculty are on the left. So the students weren't protesting conservative professors because there weren't any to protest. So it was like liberal student, liberal professors saying, you know, I'm afraid of my students now. And it wasn't like that in 2013. Now, some people have challenged me and said, oh, come on, this is just another moral panic. This isn't real. This is just self-report data. Yeah, sure, you know, the students say they're depressed. But that's just because they're, you know, Gen Z is just really comfortable uh, admitting it. So this is actually a good thing. You know, don't overreact. Don't, it's not the phones but I can show that he's wrong. And the way I can show that is by looking at data that is not self-report, data that is objective facts about what happened to teenagers. This is CDC data on the percent um, that are, actually it's not admitted to hospitals, it's brought to emergency rooms, I should update that. Uh, the, the number per 100,000, again, professors, everything has to be literally true. We cannot say anything that is not true, or at least we're not supposed to. Um, uh, so this is the rate per 100,000, and again, no trend before 2010. What happens afterward is this. Now, th these are the data, the CDC gives us two age brackets. For the older girls, the numbers are higher, um, but it's whenever I look at the data, if you look at the younger teen girls, you get these unbelievably huge increases. <coughs> 10 to 14 year old girls didn't used to cut themselves, but now they do, and we see the same thing with suicide. This is the rate of teen suicide. Now here, boys, e even though girls make more attempts, boys, um, boys, have, boys have a higher rate of completed suicide. They 
tend to use guns and high buildings. Um, it's not a call for help. It's an actual attempt to kill yourself. Girls, it's more complicated and more variable. So the numbers are higher for boys, but they both went up extraordinarily in this period. <coughs> and once again, I mean, look at these numbers. These numbers are very low. Preteen girls didn't used to kill themselves, but now they do. 67% increase in a single year, which happens to be the year that Instagram, what well, came out a year or two before, but that's the year Facebook bought it and all the girls got onto Instagram 2012. In 2013, everything takes off. Um, it's not just us. Exact same thing happened in Britain at exactly the same time. Same for Canada, same for Australia. This is Australian teens uh, brought to emergency rooms, same thing. So why, and people have given me all kinds of theories, you know, you know, the Newtown massacre, that was 2012, and kids, they have all these terrifying lockdown drills. Of course they're anxious. And yeah, school shootings are horrible things, and the lockdown drills that we do in response are horrible things, and we shouldn't be doing them, at least not in the way that we're doing them. But why would that make girls in New Zealand and Canada suddenly start cutting themselves? It doesn't make any sense. <coughs> so I think the only explanation I have found, and I've been putting this out there on my Substack, I've been calling, you know, I'm calling for credit. I'm, I'm, I created this Substack in the spirit of John Stuart Mill. He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. So I put my work out there and I ask for people to criticize me. There's an amazing thing that happens. If you ask people to make you smarter, they'll do it. They'll tell you where they think you're wrong. And sometimes they're wrong, but sometimes you've, you realize, oh wait, they're right, I need to refine this. So this is my theory in the book. It is that um, human beings had a play-based childhood from millions of years ago until sometime in the late 80s, early 90s. And then we took it away from them. It took a while um, for it to vanish. But it was especially when we gave them smartphones uh, in the twi early 2010s. Uh, um, American children, uh, Canadian children, they went from having a play-based childhood in which you can develop in normal skills to a phone-based childhood in which you can't. I, couldn't, I shouldn't say can't. Many of you are doing fine. But again, see, I have to be literally true. You know, we're not supposed to say always or never. Um, <coughs> um, so um, so uh, I won't go too deep into that because I want to get back to universities now. Oh, one more thing about this. This is really important. I didn't know this until I wrote the book. Um, this is how quickly various technologies come in. And there's always a period in which everyone is getting a radio. And everyone has to get a radio because everyone else is. And so th the internet as we know it came in in two waves. The PC came out. And once the internet came out and you could have, a, you know, you put your phone on the thing, there's that, that noise. You know, older people remember that, that horrible noise uh, from a modem. Um, so they got much more useful. So everybody is in the 90s, everyone is getting a computer and um, internet. What happens to teen mental health? It gets a little bit better, actually. What happens to democracy? It gets a lot better. Um, uh, more democracies, stronger democracies, every, the whole world is moving in that direction. We all thought, wow, the internet is amazing. The internet is going to take down all those dictators. Democracy is going to win from here on in because of the internet. But that was just the first wave. Then we get smartphones and social media. So everyone has the internet in their pocket, and everyone is on all the time on platforms that are designed to make them angry to keep them engaged. This is not good either for mental health or for democracy. <coughs> you can see what I've called the great rewiring of childhood. You can see it in this graph. <coughs> uh, this is how Americans use their time. And you can see how, much, how many minutes a day do you spend with your friends. And of course, kids in this, you know, young people in this range, of course, they're with their friends a lot more than everyone else. Everyone else is married, working, they have kids. They're not hanging out with their friends when you're 40 years old. You know, you see them once a month or something, maybe whatever it is. Um, but what happens after 2012? is this, and I want to point out something here. This data point was 2019, that was before COVID. This data point was after lockdowns. Do you see the COVID effect there? I don't. 
they were socially distancing beginning in 2012, and they were socially distancing so fast in 2019 that by the time COVID hit, they were done. They were already socially distanced. Because especially like if you're a boy, you're going to be playing computer games with your friends. That's what you desperately want to do. So you can't go over to your friend's house. You have to go home so that you can have your headset and your controller. <coughs> and even when they're together, those numbers are a gross exaggeration because even when they're together, they're on their phones. Now, this is an AI-generated uh, picture, but this is not. <laughs> so childhood has been rewired. It is now phone-based, and young people born after 1995 went through puberty on their phones, missing out on much or all of everything else in life. We start them young now. We give them toy iPhones when they're infants. We give them real iPhones when they're toddlers because then we can do our email or whatever it is that we need to do. Um, and by the time they're three or four, we often give them multiple screens. Uh, let's see if this video works. So imagine, imagine spending hours, hours a day with that kind of stimulation coming into your young brain. Tell me that's not going to have an effect. So that's as far as I'll go there. Um, this is a major part of what has happened in universities, but there's, there's so much more outside it. This is also, I believe, the greatest national health threat we face or have faced in, I don't know, ever. It's much bigger than polio, uh, much bigger than COVID in terms of kids. C COVID didn't affect young people very much, at least the disease didn't. Uh, but this is affecting most of them. All right, part two, the telos of the university. So uh, telos is an important ancient Greek word. It means like you know, teleology. It's like the, the purpose, the end for which something is done. So if I, if I say, here, I have a knife here. It's a really, really good knife. It, it's really dull. It doesn't cut anything. But this is an excellent knife. And you would say, well, you don't understand what a knife is. You, something, it's, not doing, it's not performing. It's telos. Same thing for a physician who couldn't heal. So what's the telos of a university? What is the excellence, the thing for which it is designed? The thing for which, if it's not doing it, we say that is not a good university. I think it's basically what Jim laid out to you, that it's that kind of a, an environment to create knowledge. Um, this is uh, uh, Raphael's famous painting, the, uh, the Academy of Athens. And what you can see is that people there, they're not, they're not playing, they're not fighting. They're engaging, they're talking, they're reasoning, they're arguing. Um, this is the, the nature of knowledge creation that, come, that came down to us from the ancient Greeks. You find it also in the Islamic world. The Buddhist world is not uniquely a Western thing, but it is a big part of the Western tradition. And the purpose of it all ultimately is to find truth. It's on the crests of many of our schools. Truth, knowledge, light, those sorts of metaphors. And of course, here at UVA, I was looking, our crest doesn't have any words that I could show you, but boy, did our founder have words. He had a way with words. Um, oh, I just said our. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I still feel that. I still feel, you know, when I, I really felt like I worked for, for Mr. Jefferson. Um, but, you know, as he famously said, for here we follow truth wherever it may lead. That's why we're here. And so you might say, um, this is. Jefferson's Academy is this kind of interaction, which also includes what we're doing now, just people talking, listening, learning from people who have different knowledge. And so I think we can understand the incredible success of the American brand, the higher education brand, because we got this triangle right. There's a psychological mindset, which I've shown you is discover mode. There's, there's an institution, which is a university, which is designed to capitalize on this mindset. And there's a telos, the discovery of truth, which requires this mindset and requires this institution. Individuals on their own, it's really hard to find truth as a lone researcher. You need the give and take, you need the push-pull. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, you have a Torah, a Torah study partner, and you have Ruta, I think it's called, you argue against each other. So this is the way that we come to knowledge. As individuals, we're very limited. And an institution like a university is crucial for generating knowledge. So we got this right. The Europeans couldn't do it because their universities are almost all state-run and non-residential. So students go and then they go home at night to their parents. So we got this magic of this, you know, th this undergraduate and then graduate um, education. 
And that, I think, is how we developed this world-beating brand. But then, once Gen Z came in, in defend mode, a lot of them in defend mode, they were asking for trigger warnings, they were processing speakers, not just on the right, but anyone who ever said anything that any of them didn't like. Um, they were asking for safe spaces from speakers that they didn't have to attend. Just the knowledge that, that someone was gonna speak on campus was so upsetting that they demanded the president cancel the lecture or give them a safe space where they could recover from the trauma of not going to this lecture. <laughs> and so all of these terms, these were not there in 2013, 2012. I mean, they were on the internet, but they were not front and center at universities. And then 2014 to 2016, they all came in. And the key feature that I think makes them so pernicious is that it was all part of an ideology or an approach that I call identitarianism. There are different words for this. Yasha Monk has a great book. He calls it the identity synthesis. But I think identitarianism is the most helpful term because it's an ism, a communism. You put commune, you know, the, the commune first, um, whatever it is. Um, and so identitarianism is really, really bad stuff in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, democ liberal democracy. And we can look at it um, on the right-wing version. That's very easy to see and is obviously is very resonant here. Um, on the far right, there are people who believe that white people are superior and white people should run everything and they don't run everything and we need to take it back and Jews will not replace us and all that sort of stuff. Right-wing identitarianism we all recognize and it's ugly. But left-wing identitarianism is structurally very similar with one reversal. Uh, this is a, an intersectionality chart from the 90s. I'll, I'll, I'll blow it up. Um, the difference, so, so everyone is actually focused on white people, not black people. It's actually all about white people. Um, and the right-wing folks say that white people are the best. The left-wing folks say white people are the worst um, because the whole idea of intersectionality is everybody has all these different binary elements of identity and you look at the intersection of them. If you're in any of these groups, you are privileged, which means you have power, which means you are an oppressor which means you're morally bad, you're a bad person. Whereas if you're here, you're a victim, which means you are good, you are a good person. Imagine a school that takes 18-year-old young Americans to prepare them for citizenship in a liberal democracy, as Thomas Jefferson dreamed of, and imagine taking these young people and saying, you know that whole 20th century thing about let's hate each other less because of our groups? Forget that, that's 20th century. In the 21st century, we want you to always see groups and morally mark them because that's the way to live and that's what academic scholarship is. It's about how groups oppress groups. And of course, the, the intersectional approach is you look for intersectional addresses. So it's the cisgender heterosexual white male. That is the ultimate bad person. They're the ones who caused all our problems. Um, and in the whole history of humanity, Identifying a group and saying they're the cause of all our problems has never worked out well. And so what I think happened to universities, this was not in any sense all caused by Gen Z. That was just a contributor, the anxiety, the defend mode was a contributor. But it was a set of academic ideas that then found much more fertile soil and flourished. They were always there in universities since the 70s in a few departments. But Part of the story is as the internet knocked everything over, everything could spread everywhere, these terrible identitarian, left-wing identitarian ideas spread everywhere. And instead of this magical triangle, we got a different mindset, which is incompatible with a university, and we got a different telos, a different purpose. The, uh, the protesters were all demanding that the university make social justice its purpose. That's why we're here, is to change the world. That's why we're here, is to bring about this kind of justice, that kind of equality, fight this kind of oppression. And to be clear, if students want to do that, that's great. That's not the problem. We want a diversity of political ideologies on campus. The question is, does the university change its telos to become a social justice uh, university? And if you try that, guaranteed, you will get, you will get stuck you get mired in contradiction and confusion. 
So think about a refrigerator. What's an excellent refrigerator? Oh, here's one. It's a great refrigerator. It doesn't keep anything cold, but it's good. You know, no, no. It keeps food cold. That's why it was designed. Everything about it is to keep food cold. Yeah, but I, I, I kind of need a bathtub. I, I want a bathtub. So I'm going to take this refrigerator. I'm going to lay it on its back. I'm going to take out the shelves, plug up the holes, and I'm going to make it into a bathtub. You can do that. But it's not going to be a very good bathtub. It can never be a good bathtub. It wasn't designed for that. And this, I believe, is what has happened to our elite universities. And I think it's very telling that the real, I mean, the places that are having a lot of anti-Semitism are primarily the Ivy League schools. I mean, it's scattered around the country, but it's much more in the Ivy Leagues than it is in other top schools. There's something about the Northeast and the Ivies where these ideas really took root. And uh, many of them have literally changed their purpose. Yale literally changed its mission statement to be about changing the world and improving the world rather than the pursuit of knowledge. And when that happens, you get this. You get plagiarism and you get people apologizing pr for plagiarism and you get academics, high level prominent academics, destroying our brand. Because what universities have done to themselves is said, you know what, that excellence thing, no, no. Identity comes first. Equality and uh, representation, everything has to be proportional to the US population. That's what we're after. Excellence, that's secondary. And honesty, no. Um, if you say something, whether it's true or false, if you say something that criticizes DEI, you're dead. And that is actually the fastest way to get canceled. It's very rare that someone says an overtly racist thing. At least, in, I'm sorry, I just mean in terms of the things that have blown up on campus since 2015. It's hardly ever someone said the N-word. It's usually someone on the left said something thoughtful about DEI, and that provoked outrage. That's what happened with Eric Christakis. Um, that's what happened um, at, um, uh, what was it called, in, uh, south of Seattle, um, Evergreen, right, Evergreen State College. Th the early ones, they were mostly people on the left who criticized DEI, and it caused an allergic reaction, and they were fired. So if that's the way we've reconfigured ourselves, if universities are blue team fighters for, for a particular identitarian conception of social justice, why on earth would anyone trust us who isn't on that team? So that, I think, is how we committed brand suicide. Now, there's more to the story. As I mentioned a moment ago, I think social media is a big part of the story. Um, and I've been studying this. I've been very concerned about political polarization. Um, very concerned since uh, around 2006, I started getting very worried about the trends of p political polarization. And it seemed to have something to do with the technology and cable TV and the internet. And, and it wasn't really clear what, what exactly, and I was looking at that. Um, but it was during this time that universities really changed. So the university culture has always prided itself on a kind of courage, a fearless devotion to the truth. Um, uh, you know, you know, I mean, our, some of our heroes, uh, you know, like Galileo, um, although actually, well, he did recant under pressure of torture, but there are others who, who were, uh, you know, burned at the stake for their ideas, Bruno. Um, and there was also a playfulness. And you see this in Plato's dialogues. They were having fun arguing. They weren't upset. Uh, it was fun. And for those older academics, there, there was a, used to be a magazine called Lingua Franca. It kind of came out of the humanities. It was really playful. That's what the academic life was that I fell in love with, that many older professors fell in love with. Um, and then things changed. And this is, a, I think, this internet, this very simple internet cartoon kind of explains. Something happened so that if you're wrong, you're dead. And when you live in a place like that, you shut up very quickly. Um, Deborah Mashik, the woman who first took over Heterox Academy, our first executive director, said she quit her job um, because of what, um, uh, at Harvey Mudd College, because of what she saw on campus. And when one student said to her, my motto is, silence is safer. How sad is that? Um, I've been studying the way social media changed. Before, uh, the early social media was not particularly harmful. We called them social networking systems. You'd connect to your favorite bands or your people you knew. 2009, you get the like button and the retweet button. That changes everything. 
Now you get enough data for algorithms to curate feeds. Social media becomes social media platforms, not networking systems, a social media platform. It's a thing you stand on to shout stuff. And if you're really lucky and you shout the right thing, you could get picked up and become famous. And young people have all been sucked into this vortex of desperately trying to find prestige, which is quantified. It doesn't leave much time or effort over for anything else, for any other productive activity. Um, <coughs> my more recent article, um, so I was getting very pessimistic in 2019 when I wrote this. Um, this one is so pessimistic, my wife doesn't even ever want me to talk about it. Um, <laughs> um, but my, the, um, my, my argument there as a social psychologist is, what happens when everyone gets social media, uh, everything is viral, and you can attack anyone at any time anonymously? Is that a world you'd want to live in? It's the world that we do live in. And the, one of the engineers who invented the retweet button at Twitter um, said, we just handed a loaded weapon to a four-year-old. He said that when he saw the first Twitter mobs forming. So the metaphor that I used in that article was, it's not a gun. You know, when someone tweets something terrible about you, you know, it's not like you're shot with a bullet, but it is kind of like you're shot with a dart. Like, I've never been shot with an actual metal dart, but that would really, really hurt. But if you ask people, what would you rather have, a metal dart shot into your arm or to have thousands of people tweeting about how terrible you are and demanding you be fired? Everyone who's ever gone through cancellation would say, I'll take 50 darts instead of that. It's the most painful thing that can happen to you, or one of them. Um, so once we gave everybody a dart gun, now everybody, especially in any position of authority or leadership, is a target. And so uh, professors very quickly developed the motto of silence is safer. Don't touch, don't say anything controversial, don't cover controversial material, cut it out of the syllabus, it's just not worth the risk. And students develop the same motto. This is a student in 2016 at Smith, I'll skip the first part, but she describes coming into Smith all optimistic. And then she, once she discovered the climate there, she said, I began to voice my opinion less often. Um, I learned, along with every other student, to walk on eggshells. And that's the way we've been living since 2015, on eggshells. Now, I think things are about to, uh, things are changing. We'll come back to that. But the key idea in that Atlantic article was what I, I called structural stupidity. What that means is, uh, you know, uh, just as with structural racism, you could have people not at all racist, but a system could still discriminate against people of different races. It could be built into the structure. And what I saw happening in universities was brilliant people collectively reaching stupid conclusions that are obviously contradicted by research, and no one says anything. And you've had this on both sides. I'm picking on the left because we're talking about universities, which are dominated by the left. But anytime you have no viewpoint diversity, you will get structural stupidity. And who are they shooting? They're not, people on the far left can't really hurt people on the far right. What they do is they shoot the moderates, because that's who's nearby. Those are the ones whose behavior will change. That's where you get credit for being really cool, is you shoot the moderates, and they do that on both sides. On the, f on the right, the Republican Party, I think, has become structurally stupid because they got rid of all their moderates. The Democrats criticize them however you want, but there's two wings, there's two parts of the Democratic Party. There are the moderates, the center left, and then there's the far left. And which side usually wins? It's the moderates. So the Democratic Party is not nearly as structurally stupid, I think, as the Republican Party, but the left dominates all of our institutions of knowledge creation and has damaged them severely with its structural stupidity. So both sides bear a lot of blame for the mess our country is in. But today we're talking about universities. And of course, as soon as the darts start flying, everyone who's in the center just shuts up, and that's most people. Um, so, as I said, the left controls uh, you know, all of the, uh, the um, uh, you know, artistic, aesthetic, um, intellectual uh, areas, um, and the right controls the Republican Party, um, and there are some things happening with certain Christian denominations. You also get some uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, especially in Israel, who are being much more militant and identitarian. So, um, those are the three stories I wanted to tell you three threads, three parts of the story of what happened. Now in the final part, I'm just gonna run this kind of in reverse and say, well, what can we do now? 
So why don't we just take, you know, just reverse, what, you know, I, let's just reverse those, those three things in italics, just reverse them. So what if discover mode were to, were to replace defend mode? Um, so here's a couple of suggestions. Um, one, <coughs> dirt cheap. Teach CBT to all incoming freshmen. Half of them have an anxiety disorder or depression or will soon have one. So why not forearm them with one of the most effective kinds of th psychotherapy? <coughs> it's not more effective than many other kinds, but it's so easy to do that people can do it for themselves by just reading a book, and other therapies are not like that. So it's by far the most cost-effective, multi-purpose, works for all kinds of things, CBT. And what is CBT? This is from, um, you know, I really picked this up from Greg Lukianoff, who is prone to depression and uh, nearly committed suicide in 2007, but was talked down and um, um, hospitalized and learned CBT. And so that's why that was the, this was the heart of our coddling article in 2015. These are the cognitive distortions that depressed and anxious people do. We all do these sometimes, but when you get, when your brain is set more to defend mode, you do these a lot, and that makes you more depressed and anxious, and of course you're in no condition to learn. Also, as you can see, this isn't just about depressed thinking. This is about good thinking. Avoiding these, even if you're not depressed, just learning to avoid overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking. We should be teaching that to all of our students, even aside from mental health issues. Well, how much will this cost, John? Not much. Um, we're all hiring psychotherapists faster than, we're trying to, faster than they can be minted by, from graduate schools um, because every university's mental health center is overwhelmed. So you could hire someone like Seth Gillihan. I don't know what his salary is, but I just made that up. Um, and then you could hire, say, 30 or 50 of them because that's what you'll need to deal with the mental health needs of Gen Z. Or for 10 bucks a, a piece, uh, you know, UVA, I just looked it up, UVA about 4,000 incoming freshmen. So for $40,000, you could give every incoming freshman a copy of Seth's book, which is a very good book on how to do, on CBT. Um, so this would pay enormous dividends. If you ask university presidents, what is your top concern they, it's not always number one, but it's always in the top three is mental health, usually top two, and actually usually top one. All over the country, mental health is the top concern of everybody dealing with Gen Z, and this would help. Um, another thing, at Heterodox Academy, we had a project early on. You know, I, I realized I, I learned so much when I committed to uh, writing The Righteous Mind. I was on the left back then. J Jim said we will disagree because I'm, I'm on the left, and it certainly is true. I used to be. Um, but... But in doing the research for The Righteous Mind, I forced myself not just to watch Fox News, but to read National Review. And National Review is great. I mean, the writing is great. The, the, it, you know, so it was like, wow, there's all these things I never thought of. And, um, and I thought, okay, so you know, I was exposed to these really good conservative ideas um, because I sought them out for my research. How can, we, how can we let undergrads experience the best of the left and the right when there's nobody on campus to teach the right? So I thought, well, let's just let's make a reading list. Let's, you know, w I'll pick like the best readings from left, right, and libertarian, and we'll make a reading list. And then this wonderful woman, Caroline Mell, who was working for me then, um, said, no, John, students don't want a reading list. They're not going to read it. We have to make this like like an automated, like a game, a gamified on the line, and they click and they get points, which she did. Um, and it became called Open Mind, and then we, ha we the ultimately, the organization is called Constructive Dialogue Institute. So if you go to constructivedialogue.org, um, um, our program perspectives, um, we have now three research papers showing that it works. That if you look at measures of affective polarization, that is how much do you hate the other side, that drops after people have done perspectives. And how, uh, how about intellectual humility? How certain are the, you that you're right? and intellectual humility um, goes, goes up. So it works, and there are some discussions here at UVA, it's being used, um, actually Virginia is the leading state, it's being used at about 15 Virginia universities, and I th it's being tested here, but if you have any, uh, um, does anybody here work for UVA administration, deans, uh, any sort of uh, staff? Raise your hand if you're, if you're that sort of, okay, there are a few of you. Um, I hope you'll find a place to try it out um, and then implement it for every incoming freshman. 
Um, okay, second, what if truth were to replace social justice as the telos? Uh, now here we have to talk about leadership uh, because as in the corporate world, the executive, the leader, is responsible for the culture. No one else can change it. The leader has to decide which way are we going. Leadership is crucial. And at MIT, they made a terrible mistake. Um, there, they, this is a famous case a couple years ago. Uh, a professor at Chicago had written um, uh, an essay in Newsweek criticizing DEI. Um, he was a well-known astrobiologist, something, something about uh, in astronomy. He was invited to give a prestigious lecture at MIT, and I think was a graduate student, freaked out because this guy is against DEI. He's a danger to our community. We cannot let this guy speak at this prestigious lecture. And so some mid-level dean canceled the talk. Okay, that happens. People make mistakes. Universities make mistakes. And I was fully expecting that the MIT leadership would say, whoa, no, okay, you know, the alumni are pissed at us. Sorry, the alumni are angry. Um, 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 you know, this was embarrassing, but they didn't. They doubled down. And that was Sally Cornblue. Or actually, it, was, it wasn't her. It was the one before. But MIT leadership doubled down and said, nope, you know, DEI, this person's a threat. We're not having them. Um, so that is that was a national, that was another uh, example of the shame of higher ed. So how can higher ed escape from this shame cycle? <coughs> the most disgusting incident, I think, was at, at Evergreen, where the students took the, pr the president hostage, and it's, this is all on video, and they ordered him around, they cursed at him, you know, they said, you know, put your hands down when he raised his hands. Put your hands down. My hands are down. That's what he said. So weak leaders, there are a lot of weak leaders of universities. Um, they're afraid of their students. That's why they didn't say anything on October 8th. They're afraid of certain students. Um, they uh, don't challenge the protesters' narrative, so the, that narrative wins. They validate the worst story told about their institution, and they, they validate the use of intimidation, threats, shouting, um, um, and therefore they get more of it. Strong leaders do the opposite, and there are several. I can count them on one hand, but there's a few um, who were strong leaders during this difficult time. Um, and they, they're academics with backbone. Those are not always contradictory. Um, they, um, they respond thoughtfully. And so one of the best cases was Marvin Krislov at Oberlin, of all places, one of the you know, most progressive schools in the country. When the students came in with their demand, there's always a list of 50 to 100 demands, free this, give us time off for that, pay us for our protesting, things like that. So <laughs> when, li literally, literally, um, one of them was free laundry detergent because not all of us can afford laundry detergent. That's your demand to the president? Um, so, um, so when they came to his office and they, you know, they you know, took over the building and they demanded, you know, here's our list of our demands, um, he said no. He just said no. He acknowledged, uh, uh, um, he acknowledged earlier, he acknowledged some of their points are valid. He's happy to talk with them. Um, but he says, I will not respond to this ultimatum. And this contains attacks on my faculty and staff who are dedicated. And this was almost never done of a president defending someone that the students were attacking. So Marvin Krislov gets the award for one of the few presidents who I think did the right thing. So leaders must guard the telos of the university. Leaders must talk about anti-fragility, that is students are not fragile. They actually need exposure to ideas that disturb them. They need to wrestle with people who think differently. They need to be uncomfortable sometimes. That's actually what I used to do here in my Psych 101 class. I was known as a provocative teacher. That used to be a term of praise in higher ed, provocative. And I would, I would put things out there that were kind of disturbing. And I had 75 minutes to explain everything and bring it in for a landing to resolve everything. I don't have that anymore because, I don't know if you have it here at UVA, but at NYU, we have a bias response line. On every student's ID, it says, you know, emergency 911 on the back. 911, campus safety, uh, campus transportation, bias response line. So if I say anything provocative, students can call it in, text it in, go online, and report me before I even get to the 75 minute mark. Um, <coughs> so we've got to stop that. We've got to, well, this one's complicated, but okay. Uh, and then third, leaders need to respond wisely to crises. Now, early in the Twitter era, people didn't understand this. 
And as soon as there was a Twitter mob accusing a faculty member of something, the president or the, you know, whatever, the university would fire them right away if they could. They'd be fired within 24 hours. And that was a terrible mistake because that basically validated this method of approach. Um, <coughs> and finally, what if curiosity replaced um, fear? Um, our, our relatively new president, two years now, John Tomasi, um, wrote a beautiful article when he first came in. Um, there was a debate at Hedrox Academy. I asserted that the telos is truth, and, and we've had a, a lovely debate. Others uh, have, said, have said other things. Uh, John said, um, well, truth, yes, is important, but actually curiosity um, should be our key virtue. And as he points out here, um, curiosity is prior to truth. Without curiosity, we would not get to truth. So anyway, this has been really John's approach. He, he left a chaired professorship of philosophy at Brown, um, and he just perfectly exemplified what we're trying to do at Heterodox Academy, um, which is we're not here to attack wokeness or the left. We're here because we love universities, and we want them to return to their mission and be excellent and honest. And so I would urge um, all of you to join, well, all of you who are, f who are insiders in the academic world. What I mean is you're permanent stakeholders. You are professors, you are uh, UVA staff, uh, uh, anything like that. If you are a member, if you are listed on a university webpage as someone who is part of the university, um, please join. The, it's free. Um, as was said uh, in, the begin uh, in the beginning, there are 60 members here. Uh, and while they're the third largest, I think they're the richest because they did an incredible job of fundraising because the alumni generally want the university to be a university. So this, this chapter here is, I think, the best chapter in the country, and they have the resources to bring it with Barry Weiss. You're bringing in uh, Barry Weiss and who else? Yeah, okay, so things are, okay. But th so things are happening here at, U at, at UVA. So I wanna first, everyone in the audience, uh, raise your hand if you are a Heterodox Academy member, raise your hand high. Okay, great, great to see you all. I saw some of you at, at the reception. Now, everyone in the audience who is a professor or staff uh, member at UVA and is not a member of HXA, please raise your hand high right now. Go ahead, raise your hand high. Okay, good, there's a, lo a lot of you. Um, I, I inv invite you and, and urge you all to join. Um, it's free, check it out. All you do is agree to a statement about supporting viewpoint diversity and open inquiry. Um, and the thing that I found as I've been traveling around is that so many faculty members felt alone after 2015. They felt the world's going crazy around me. People are violating their professional duties all around me. And what do I do? And everybody felt alone. But it turns out most people are reasonable, most professors are reasonable. And whether you're on the left or the right, most professors actually want an open environment. They want free speech. They want viewpoint diversity. And so Heterodox Academy campus communities are bringing them together. So all of you who are eligible, please, uh, please join. Um, and right here's the UVA chapter. It's one of you know, one of the best. Um, and we also just started a center for academic pluralism. So if you want, we got money, a, bi a big grant. We can we um, we bring in about eight or ten people a semester or a year to live in New York City and be part of a, a group thinking about the importance of intellectual pluralism. So please apply for that. Um, so to conclude, and this really is the the end here. Um, we once had a brand that was possibly the strongest in history. Um, we ruined it. Um, here's how we ruined it, and here's what we can do to restore it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Height, for that wonderful lecture. Um, we are going to move into a brief question and answer period. Um, I, I respectfully ask you all to limit yourselves to one question per audience member, as well as keep it to a question and limit any remarks or comments or stories as much as we would love to hear them. We'd like to be respectful of everybody's time tonight. Um, <laughs> My uh, good colleague Aiden here is going to be stationed up near the College Republicans sign that is to your right. And if you would start to form the line there, we can jump into it um, and go from there. Anyway, actually, can, can I ask, 
what I like to do, the first question, first of all, is there anybody here who was offended by anything I said or who strongly disagrees with what I said? If there is, please come up and ask a question because that's, that's how we actually make progress. Hello, um, my name's Janet. I am. Uh, I graduated from UVA. My husband also, and we had a, two of our four kids graduated from here, so we're very fond of UVA. Uh, I I very much enjoyed your talk, and I I just wonder. I seem it seems like you are touching on a topic, but you're avoiding it. <laughs> and the reason I'm saying it is because I raised my kids full time, and you, you talked about Lenore Skenazi and free range kids, and you show pictures of babies at institutional care. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with Erica Komisar. Oh yeah, and I just saw her last week in New York. Yeah, yeah. so I, it's like I, I think that that's a topic that people are afraid to, to talk about. And if you wanna know what it's like to be not welcome in the world is to be a full-time mom. Uh, you right. go to a cocktail party, no one wants to talk to you. <laughs> I mean, I have four grown sons. Yeah, yeah, and no, I think. And no I, I just would like to know if you yeah. ever mention that. Thank you. Study. You know what? I haven't mentioned it, but it's a perfect example that we're talking about tonight. So here's the question. Uh, your name again is Shannon. Janin? J Janet. Okay. So Janet is referring to a basic question that social scientists should have answered by now. And that is, if a woman goes to work uh, when her kids are very young, how do the take kids turn out? Straight empirical question, a huge amount riding on it. We don't know the answer, or rather I should say, we don't do good research on it. Because if you try to study that and you get the wrong result, you're in big trouble. And so what happens is decade after decade, um, uh, anything that is politically controversial doesn't get studied in the social sciences, especially if it's about child development or education. Those are incredibly woke fields. They, they, they really punish dissent. Uh, and just a clear example, um, it was known in the 90s that whole word reading techniques don't work well, whereas phonics works well. It was known in the 90s. And just recently, there was yet another round of, the research shows we should stop this, but they don't stop because it's an ideology. So while I've never myself talked about the issue, because I'm don't know, i not an expert, I haven't read the studies, so I don't want to opine on it, but it's a great example of where we need the social sciences, and the social sciences have been irresponsible and not done good research. Thank you. And of course, Erica's research shows, actually, in general, it's bad for the kids. Hi, thanks for your talk. I'm Jessica Ote. I'm a staff member here at the School of Data Science. One of the things I've noticed is that many people, I mean, it's great if we can change the academy, but many people who were in the academy recently have been forced out or self-selected out. And so I'm wondering what you have to say for those people, because one of the things I've noticed is that often people who really could make a, made a genuine, wonderful contribution to the academy as perfectly reasonable people when they exit, they become radicalized. Two examples, James Lindsay and Brett Weinstein. Oh, absolutely, that's right. So we live in a polarizing environment. Um, so I'll start with the, the first part of your question. Um, the pipeline problem is very severe because undergraduates pick up by the time they graduate. If they're not on the left, and especially if they're conservative and especially if they're Christian, if you are a devout Christian um, or if you are conservative, you get the sense by the end of college, I'm not welcome here, this is not for me. And if you do apply to grad school, you'll get it even more strongly because many faculty are pretty are careful about what they say. And the surveys show this, that students are not so much afraid of their professors. The students are afraid of other students primarily. And the professors are afraid of these students as well. So the professors aren't doing such a bad job teaching undergrads actually, um, but they're much more open with grad students. And so, because you're part of the club now, and so if you're a conservative or Christian graduate student, now you really get the sense of, uh, I'm really not welcome here. So we lose out on all that talent, and it's not just losing talent, it's losing out on the kind of diversity that we most desperately need. And if you do make it to a faculty position, then you have to come up for tenure. And then, anyway, so yes, it's, it's a terrible mess, so what can we do? Um, first, we, we desperately need multiple models of higher ed and that's why I'm so pleased about the University of Austin, and I'm on the advisory board of that university. It's a totally new university, starting from scratch, 
um, focused on classics in the early years and doing things, building things, making things in the later years. Um, and it's not going to have any of the nonsense that we talked about. Uh, that's one university, but Pano Canelos, the president, has ideas for changing, uh, what's it called, not certification, what's it called? Every university has to be, accredit thank you, accreditation. Because all the accreditation stuff, all the accreditors, they demand DEI stuff. And so, um, so there's going to be a move to have different channels. Because, you know, if, if the states are supposed to be laboratories of democracy, why not the universities? We should have a variety of universities. So we're going to need that. But we don't want to give up on, on all of our great universities. So I think some are beyond salvageable. Um, and I thought that about the Ivy League schools, although actually there are faculty at Harvard and Penn that are really pushing back. So even those might not be lost. UVA is so well situated. It has the moral resources of its history, Jefferson, free speech. Um, it's in the South, not the Northeast. Um, it's a sane place. Um, so, uh, so UVA, I think, really, um, you know, if the, if the leadership, what, what are you laughing at? Is it <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was when I left. What have you done to it? Yeah. So, okay, so thank you. Only one question. <laughs> so um, I also was from the School of Data Science, but um, you know, graduated a few years ago. I'm not sure if things have changed since then, but I'm thinking back to the ethics classes there and thinking, like, I don't think we really covered much of social media during that, or, like, why... I don't think, like, any of the problems that you discussed here would necessarily violate any of the ethical ideas we talked about during that, or for where I currently work. None of the AI is trending. Wait, I'm sorry. What, what about social media? I'm, I don't wanna, what's the question? Like the none, none of like the problems that you discussed here with like how social media like has radicalized people mm -hmm. and all that stuff like really violates any of the ethical principles that we've discussed in mm -hmm. like you know classes or in my current company, etc. So I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering like, is is that really at the root of like parts mm -hmm. radicalization? Yeah. Like how do we I don't <coughs> yeah. know get it? Yep. Thank you. Uh, I understand. Yes. Yeah, so I think, I think it is for this reason. I've been reading some of the great 20th century media theorists who, when television was coming in, big changes to society. People like Marshall McLuhan and Neil Postman especially. And they pointed out that when, you know, once it becomes television, you sit and you're a passive consumer and everything becomes entertainment. That's what it did and it affected our politics. Everything became entertainment. Social media is very different. Social media is not passive. You're active, you're out there, you're trying to create emotions. So if you have a citizenry that is dr doing this, it's like, you're, you know, it's like if you took the entire Earth's atmosphere, which is 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and you said, let's flip it. Let's make it 80% oxygen, 20% nitrogen. Every, th every spark would be a conflagration. That, I think, is what's happened to us. So at least that's what my next book is on. Okay, thanks. And I'll try to go quickly and see if there's a lot of questions, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. Hey, Professor. Hi, um, we're two students from UVA. Great. Um, I also read your book, The Coddling of the American Mind, and loved it. Thank it you. It was at Blue Ridge with Sam, who's over there. Hey, Sam. Um, anyways, Zoe and I have a question for you regarding, like, your advice for students, because a lot of your talk was, I mean, rightfully so, aimed at, um, like, adults and, and university associates. So, um, here, go ahead, Zoe. Yeah, and I just want to quickly throw into, I'm actually in a class that's doing your perspectives module, so it's at UVA already. What, what class is it? Um, political dialogue in the education school. Oh, in the education school, that's great. That's rare. I mean, I, but yes, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, so just, just advice, so the question is just advice for? Yes, yes, so adding on to Zoe, the question is, um, like, in your opinion, how can students at a university um, kind of help eliminate the polar political polarization without putting themselves in danger? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Now, you're right. In, in my book, The Anxious Generation, I was going to have a chapter of advice for Gen Z, and it just felt like corny old guy stuff, and I realized... I really, ne we need policy changes, so I really did address the book. You're right to pick that up, that I'm r I was really talking much more to adults, that's true. At, th thank you. Um, at NYU, I teach a course called Flourishing for undergrads, and, um, and I have a version for MBA students. And actually, and, and the course is about how do you become, 
and, and I taught it because we had so much depression like everywhere. So it's about how do you become smarter, stronger emotionally, and more sociable. And, and I work with students to do that. And if they do that, then they will be more successful in love and in work, in relationships and work. And everything we know in psychology says, if you're more successful in relationships and work, you're gonna be as happy as you can be. So I'll give you the most important thing, the most important first step. Regain control of your inputs. Regain control of what comes into your eyes and ears. All of my students, almost all of them, I work on their morning routine, evening routine. What's the first thing you do when you open your eyes? Do you get a drink of water? Do you go to the bathroom? What do you think? You grab your phone, you check your notifications. What about the evening routine? What's the last thing that young people do before they literally close their eyes? Check their notifications. And what do you do in between? Check your notifications. So I urge all of you, we don't have time to do this now, but sometimes when I have more time, I urge the audience, especially young people, do this tonight. Take out your phone, go to settings, screen time, um, notifications, look at, your no look at how many you get. If you're young, you probably get between 200 and 500 a day. 200 to 500 times a day, you allow companies or friends to interrupt you. That means that young people never have 10 minutes to think. They never can focus for 10 minutes. And so you can't accomplish anything if you don't have control of your attention. So it's, it's miraculous. I tell them, shut off every notification. Just shut it entirely off, except for five. Pick five to keep on, like Uber. You know, you're gonna want to keep on, you know, keep five. And, and the results are miraculous. They report like, oh, I can study now. I have time to talk to my friend. You know, so that's the first step. Just uh, So um, yeah, that's my first piece. I've got a lot more, but we'll stop there. Hi. Um, my experience comes from um, the medical center across the street. And um, it, um, it, it seems the, the points are, are very um, accurate in the, the social sciences, but I'm wondering if there are um, the same things are happening in the, yeah. the science where truth is particularly research-based. Have um, are there lessons to be learned from that side of yeah. the street or um, cautions? Thank you. If if we could transport back to 2016, I would have said you're right. This is a humanities problem, and it's the studies departments, the ones that were created explicitly for activism. That's where the problem is worst. Natural sciences, math, no problem. That was 2016. Now it's everywhere. So you get, you know, there's, you know, Afrochemistry. You get uh, equity requirements for hiring. You get sensitivity training. It's happening all over the university, um, and medicine is really bad. Um, in fact, here at UVA, um, there was a big, a big one four or five years ago before COVID. Um, there was a mandatory lecture on microaggressions, and an NY a UVA med student stood up and asked a question of the speaker, like, well, you, you know, I disagree, or this doesn't make sense, and I believe he was expelled. He was expelled from, me from medical school. That's right. So wo wokeness has taken over all of our knowledge creating institutions. So Barry Weiss has been amazing on this. If you don't subscribe to um, uh, for the free, pre free press, please do, because she's really covered. It took over psychology, psychiatry, medicine, um, obviously journalism, media, the arts. So it, it's there. Talk to, uh, to uh, are there any other, other medical faculty here? Raise your hand for uh, the medical school. Okay, am I, am I right or wrong on what I just said? Okay, but it, yeah, but it, okay, but the problem, the, yeah, the problem is there. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, next question. Okay. Thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm a fourth year student at UVA studying political and social thought. Um, and I agree with much of the story you've told about the university, and it's particularly concerning because the university is such a, an important feature of the public realm. And I'm concerned because we're living so much more of our lives online, as you've also discussed. And we've been convinced by social media companies that Twitter and X is the town square that we really need. And so online you have an excess of free speech, it seems. Um, 
people being able to express themselves no matter how abusive the content. Um, and now we have disinformation. And so how do we balance restricting spe content online that's just um, deteriorating um, our institutions and then increasing free speech at on campuses? Thank you. That, that's a great question and a really good one to end on. I've been focused on two problems. One is what social media and related stuff is doing to teens, to young people. And the other is what it's doing to democracy. So this allows me to end by just giving the, the big picture there. <coughs> um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg often says, how could it be wrong to give more people more voice? Um, connecting people up, the telephone was amazing, the early internet was amazing, blogs, anybody could get their opinions out. And people would read it, and they would tell their friends, or they'd write about it. It was amazing. And then we get the social media transition and the virality. And is it a public square? It became much more like the Roman Colosseum. People would go to the Roman Colosseum not to see beautiful skills of athletics, but to see people being speared, eaten, stabbed, devoured by lions. That was what was exciting. And that's why people would pay to go in. And that's what Twitter is. That's what Twitter did. Um, so it's not true. It, yes, it's become the public square in a sense, but it's a horrible public square. And if you just read the Federalist Papers, which I know Republicans actually read, Democrats don't, but I, oh, this is being recorded. I should probably be careful what I say. <laughs> but, <coughs> um, but read Federalist 10. This is exactly what James Madison was, wor was worried about, was democracy is ruled by the people, but the people are passionate, easily led astray by the unruly passions or something like that. So Madison designed things to resist that. So we're, we're not a democracy directly. We're a republic with democratic, important democratic elements. And that worked really well for a long time. And I don't know if it can work in the network era. We're, we're beyond the Gutenberg era was based on print and text, and we were the greatest country ever created. And now we're in the network era, and it's not clear that our architecture will work. So it's up to you and your generation to figure out how to change these systems and then how to live in the insane environment that we're bequeathing you. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Thank you for, to our sponsors and, uh, and friends, and thank you for everybody for coming. Just one note before you all, uh, before you all leave. Uh, we have another, the Jefferson Council has another big event coming up April 9th. This is our third annual meeting. The issue is governance, and we will be talking about the issue that Mr. Hyde raised, what do we do? here at UVA. So um, check us out at www.thejeffersoncouncil.com. Hope you can make it. Thank you. That was just fabulous. That was fabulous. Thanks so much. So, um,